Guys, welcome to Busy Bee. Thank you for coming out. This is obviously the first class after Garden Fest. It's always a packed house, but that's because it's orchids too. So um, those of you that went to Garden Fest, did any of you catch the talk that I did on Saturday? Yes or no? No. Okay, you missed a good talk. There were some neat plants at Garden Fest this year. Um, don't put those with these, keep them separate. Okay, um, before you guys leave, we do have some door prizes for you guys. There are three gift cards and I've got some cuttings to give away to you. Um, so if you didn't sign a little slip and put it in the tub up front, make sure you get one signed and get your name in there. So I've got some goodies to give away to you today. You got enough? Okay, just rip it off, it tears. Yep. Perfect, thank you. And then you can have a seat again. If you guys don't know Sherry, that's Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Say hi, Sherry. Still got a couple more people getting ready to sit down. <laughs> and here comes two more. Just for those of you that are having a little trouble hearing, we are purchasing a sound system with a mic, a wireless mic headset, so that you guys will be able to hear us a little bit better. Um, I've got a big mouth, so you should be able to hear me okay. If you can't, just let me know and I'll yell a little louder. Everybody knows I have a big mouth when it comes to orchids. All right. Is this your 20th anniversary here? This is Dan and Tina Nelson's 20th anniversary owning Busy Bee. Yes. Mm -hmm. Busy Bee's been here for a very long time. Oh, yes. Then, but I just yes. Yep, it's their 20th anniversary this year. So it has changed considerably in the last five years. Mm -hmm. They've done a fantastic job here. That's why I came here. Not to mention that Dan and Tina are really good people. <laughs> Do I have anything brown on my nose? <laughs> Tina's over there. All right. Come on in, folks. We'll get y'all seated and we'll start the class. All right, I think we've got everybody. Hi everybody, my name is Paul. Hi Paul. Hi. Who doesn't know me? You're going to by the end of this class. <laughs> I'll pray for you. <laughs> um, my name is Paul Price. I've been the previous president, vice president, of the Bureau Beach Orchid Society. Been growing orchids since 1995. First orchid I ever bought is here today. Oh, nice. um, I've told the story a couple of times. I'll give you guys the story again because it's actually kind of funny. Um, I started growing orchids back in 1995. A friend of mine went to go see an orchid nursery that I saw in Orlando. I told her about it. We went down there, looked at it, and it was Ritter Orchids. Tom Ritter up in Orlando. Um, she went in, bought a bunch of plants. I went in with her and in the front greenhouse, um, they had this huge vanda. It's always in bloom for Valentine's Day. Um, and the plant was, I mean, it was massive. There were 14 big kikis on it um, and had to have at least 20 flower spikes on it. Really big plant, beautiful. Um, and Tom and his wife, Evelyn at the time, um, we're growing the orchids. You'd go into the greenhouse and Evelyn would tell you, I'm the nice one, come talk to me and I'll sell you plants. And Tom would be back working in the greenhouse, taking care of the plants and doing everything else. Well, I saw that plant and looked at Evelyn and I said, do you, is that for sale? Being naive, not growing orchids, didn't know how much it was gonna cost or if it was for sale. She said, no, it's not for sale. And Evelyn could be a little gruff to be kind about it. Um, she could be a little rough on the edges sometimes. So I go, 
Okay, do you have one besides that that's for sale? No. Okay. Um, well, if you ever divide it, you know, can I put my name down for a piece of it? No, I'm never dividing it. Okay. Can I get the name? Okay, I'll give you the name. So I, I got the name, looked for it, looked for it, couldn't find it at a couple of shows I went to, not knowing it was an old hybrid and cross. Um, I kept shopping at Odom, started getting into the bug and started buying plants. I went back one time and the plant was gone out of the middle of the front greenhouse. I walked in and looked at Tom and the girls that were working in there. I said, what happened to that plant? And they looked at me and said, you didn't hear? I said, hear what? They said, Evelyn died. Tom pulled it down and chopped it up. Divided it, chopped it up, and sold off the different pieces. I said, well, do you still have any? He says, yeah, I still have, I have, I have a couple. Why, did you want one? I said, yeah. Yeah, I wanted one. So I got one. Now, I've had it since 1995. This is it. Um, it's not very happy with me because of the cold weather this year. It's always in bloom and the thrips right now are wreaking havoc on the flower spikes. If you look at the flower spikes, you'll see some of the buds are dried out and they're shriveled up. That's thrip damage. So, thrips, no seums. No seums are enemies when you have orchids. So. I brought Evelyn out for show and tell. Now, because Evelyn was so gruff about that, I named, that plant has a name, but I call it Evelyn. So, um, it's Opstylus Memoria Mary Natris. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yep, that's its name. It's a very old hybrid cross of Vanda's. It's very hard to find that cross um, there's only a couple of places down in Miami I've heard of that have been selling it. Um, that's about a $300 orchid now. So they're just that hard to get. It's very slow growing, you know, considering I've had this since 1995. I've only gotten two kikis off of it and I gave, you know, took the kikis off the plant and gave them to very good friends. So I shouldn't have done that, but they're good friends. So. I do like to share my orchids every once in a while. But that's, that's the story behind Evelyn. And everything I've done, it has never died. Kiki is a baby plant. You know that. Why are you raising your hand? Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. <laughs> OK. Um, those of you that went to Garden Fest, what did you think you saw that was primarily missing from this show? Besides the vendors, that was obvious. No, you don't do that during Garden Fest. Not at Garden Fest, you don't. Not at Garden Fest. The main thing that you normally see at Garden Fest are these guys, fails. They were, the, the quantities that I saw at Garden Fest was pathetic. It was the worst showing I've seen for Phalaenopsis orchids that I've ever seen at Garden Fest. Normally Garden Fest is known as a fail, fail sale. Um, there are ladies that come there from the island that come in and buy trays of them. There were not the fails there this year. There's a reason for that. You guys have heard of that supply chain issue? Yeah. Yeah, these are coming from China. Oh. Now, I talked to two vendors at the show. They told me that all their plants were sitting on containers off the port of Los Angeles for about two months inside containers. Oh, Those plants are dead. Yeah, they are. Oh. So, now I'm gonna warn you with the supply chain issues that are going on right now, I would fully expect the price of Phalaenopsis to go up. Um, because a lot of the growers have not been able to get them. So I don't know what's going to happen down the road, but I'm expecting it. Um, they're just going to be harder to find right now. Okay. 
Um, what I'm going to try and teach you guys today is a little bit of general information. We're going to go over some chemicals because we're coming into spring. We're also going to touch on repotting because it is repotting season. Now there's an asterisk next to that about repotting season. The supply chain issue comes up again. Pots are almost impossible to get right now. Any molded plastic pot that you're looking to buy, I'm going to guarantee is out of stock. And the supply chain they're telling us now, not until 2023. So what's going to happen is we can still get clay pots without a problem. I can still get these. I cannot get these. And every orchid grower in the state of Florida is screaming bloody murder because they can't get these. So it's going to be interesting. Um, now from here on out through the month of May is your primary repotting season. This is the time of year that you start repotting your orchids. I want to do a little simple test and I've done this before at different classes. Raise your hand if you have between one and ten orchids. Okay, put your hands down. Raise your hand if you have like between 20 and 50. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, let's go for 100 or more. All 50 to 100. Yeah, I knew you two would. 200. About 150. Anybody else over 150? Yeah, I know you do. I've seen your Facebook page. You should be ashamed of yourself. Um, let's try 600 orchids. I just moved around the corner. God help me, I don't ever want to move again. Um, not a fun time to move 600 orchids in a 24 by 30 foot greenhouse. Over 600 orchids. I stopped counting. So, um, like I said, I've been collecting since 1995. So it starts with one orchid and you end up where I'm at. Um, it's not a hobby, it's a disease. <laughs> There's only one cure and it's another orchid. <laughs> the reason most people get into orchids is because they want something to flower. Um, not every orchid blooms all the time. So when you start getting into multiple orchids, you'll get stuff that blooms at different times of the year. Now, how many of you have dappled light like underneath an oak tree? Okay. How many of you have full sunlight? No shade at all. No shade at all. Raise your hand. I have no shade at my house, at the new house now. It's, the yard is full sun. So that's not, that's not a bad thing. I'm rebuilding the greenhouse now. I'm still in the process of putting the roof on the last 20 feet of a 20 by 50 greenhouse. So how many of you experienced the cold weather and hauled everything inside? I still have stuff inside. <laughs> um, I didn't get a chance to put it all in. Um, that last night where it dipped down to what? I think it was 31 degrees and we had frost on the ground. Not good for 600 orchids. So, so far I'm, I'm lucky I don't see any major damage. I don't see any damage on the plants. I am seeing, you see the red speckling in the leaves on Evelyn? That's from cold. So she's not happy with me, but she'll be okay. Um, I'm sure Evelyn's up there cussing at me right now. <laughs> So Evelyn was, was really an interesting human being. I, I, I loved it because she told me, you know, I'm the nice one. After she passed, I got to know Tom, the nicest, kindest gentleman you will ever meet. He was absolutely wonderful. Every time you walked in to deal with Evelyn, oh boy, it was interesting. So um, what I wanna do is touch on, I'm asking you guys about shade and full sun for a reason. There are orchids that you can grow in just about any kind of sun exposure. And I've got a good assortment here. A lot of them like filtered light to bright full sun in the morning. 
but they need protection during the middle of the day. Now the only thing that I've got out here that will take full sun all day long are these guys, the Tarit Bandas. So I'm going to touch on leaf shape real quick because that's how you tell what kind of light your orchid wants and where you All right, if you look at um, any of these plants up here, you're going to see a different variance of leaf shapes, widths, and length. All right, the shorter, wider that leaf is, that means it's trying to collect as much light as possible. Think of the leaf as a solar collector. It's trying to collect light to build up energy for the plant. All right, Phalaenopsis. Short, wide leaves. What kind of light do you think it's growing in? Filter. Shade, filtered. This is an orchid that you can actually grow indoors without a problem. And it will rebloom indoors just as long as you go down 20 degrees every night for three weeks inside the house. So it's not gonna do that. So you need to put it outside when it starts getting cool out and that will induce the flower spike on this guy's. Um, dendroviums. And I'm gonna go over some basic orchids and the different varieties and give you leaf shapes and tell you what kind of light they grow in. And I'll show you a couple other features will, that will tell you how to water them and take care of them. Right now, I wanna show you which ones to choose for your light conditions. Dendrobium, so shorter, wider leaf. It will grow in bright, um, filtered light, but you can also acclimate them out into full sun. You can mount this on the side of a palm tree or on a tree and it will go nuts. The only thing with these guys is they don't like temperatures below 50 degrees. So once you mount them on a tree, they tend to hold up a lot better, but if you leave them in a pot or a basket, you're gonna need to bring them in at 50 degrees, okay? Now, shorter leaf, a little bit wider. It will grow in deep shade or bright indirect light to full sun. So you can get away with a lot with this, but it's gonna bloom better in bright light to full sun, okay? It's a dendrobium. We call this a hard cane dendrobium. When you don't have the stakes on here, the canes stick up hard. Um, they stand up nice and proud without any problem. That's considered a hard cane dendrobium. Okay, let's touch on, yes, bright light, bright and bright indirect light or full sun. Yeah, on a screen porch, under a pool cage, anything like that, yeah. On a tree in full sun? Yep. Now you have to acclimate it out into full sun slowly, you just don't take it out there you know once it's been in a greenhouse so you have to acclimate them slowly and you do that with a little bit of sun in the morning and you know keep them out a little bit longer as time goes by um, and do it over a couple of weeks so keep them in the pot and then after a couple of weeks put them on the pot. yeah just start acclimating them to brighter light this supposed to be a nun orchid um, this was for sale at garden fest there was only one vendor I saw that was carrying nun orchids. I've been trying to push it to get the flowers to open. I'll guarantee you this will open tomorrow. <laughs> you can't push them. You can't rush them. They're going to do what they want to spite you. It's a nun orchid. It is a terrestrial plant that will do well in your landscape. Uh, different plant. Um, it is a terrestrial plant. They're getting harder and harder to find. So you have to look for them. They used to be very common. You could find them just about anywhere at Garden Fest. Several different people would have them in their booths, um, but only one person had them this year. Um, very popular, so. And they like bright light or filtered light? Bright filtered light, yes. 
they grow in the, in the dirt, terrestrial, okay? Let's touch on something real quick for you guys. How many of you, have the, this is your first time jumping into orchids? Raise your hand. Okay, orchids are typically epiphytic or lithophytic. Epiphytic meaning they will grow on bark on the side of trees. Lipophytic meaning they will grow on rocks. Um, there are some orchids that are terrestrial. That means they will grow in the ground in dirt, soil. All right, most of your potted orchids up here will not grow in dirt. Um, there's too many bacteria, too many bugs for them to get into, so you don't want to grow them that way. Okay, now the epiphytic types of orchids also are vandas. All right, we're the dummies that put them in a little plastic ba basket to hold them up. Um, normally this is going to be attached to a tree um, and then hanging down and flowering that way. These guys, if you want to take them out of the baskets and attach them to trees, they will do very well in this area. You just have to remember to water them frequently. And we'll touch on watering a little bit and I'll show you why and how to learn how, how much water your specific orchid type takes. There's a couple of key points to look at. Now, there's Four different Vanda groups that I'm going to touch, or not Vanda, but orchid groups that I'm going to touch on that you're primarily going to find for sale. That's Phalaenopsis, the moth orchids, Dendrobiums, the hard canes down here on the end, Vandas, which are these guys, and the one in the pot. The one in the pot you're going to find a little bit harder. You got to look for them but at the bigger orchid shows, you can find them. Now, lucky for you at Busy Bee, there's an inside, somebody has cuttings, they're for sale in the front, or yeah, in the front shade house by the orchid room, there's two pots full of cuttings. The Andersonii, which is the one with the yellow lip, very hard to get, it is a species. Those plants came out of Jamaica originally, um, but you don't see that species very often for sale but it's a neat plant and this is its main blooming period. The other variety that we have in there is Miss Joaquin. It is the same type of Vanda to eat. It grows in full sun just like this one. This one grows out in the middle of my yard, um, but it has a pink flower, no yellow throat on the lip. Okay. The other type of orchid, and I don't really have any here, are Oncidiums the dancing lady orchids. If you look in the tree, in the oak tree over by the driveway, you're gonna see a basket hanging down. That is an Oncidium. They do extremely well in baskets in our climate um, and will grow like weeds. Um, absolutely love our climate. That orchid is actually from a friend of mine who passed away from thyroid cancer that one's name is Marion. So that Marion's living here now. So um, it's not for sale. You can't have it. Sorry. So that has sentimental value. Um, those are the four orchid species that you're going to find primarily for sale. Now, the Vero Beach Orchid Society has a show coming up in April. You'll find a whole lot of other stuff for sale at the shows. The other thing um, there's another orchid type that you're going to find for sale. How many of you know about Odom's orchids down in Fort Pierce? Okay. John Odom grows primarily Cataleas. He does grow other stuff. Um, he's got 28 greenhouses full. He is the largest retail orchid seller in the United States of America. Nobody else has that much. John's an addict. He's got it worse than I do. So um, now is the main blooming time for those greenhouses. You'll walk in there and there'll be thousands of flowers right now. So it's, it's actually a good time to go visit him. Um, if you do, say you, you, know, you heard a talk from me up at Busy Bee, let him know that I sent you down there. Um, Odom's Orchids. 
Yeah, Odom's Orchids in Fort Pierce. Now, I'm not supposed to be promoting another nursery, but I like John. He's a nice guy. Um, and he grows Cattleyas, and I don't grow or sell Cattleyas primarily here, but John does. He was at Garden Fest. Their booth sold out. They had nothing left in the booth at the end of Garden Fest. Usually I'm taking back about 20 trays. He had nothing left after, after Garden Fest this year. So they literally sold out. I, I looked at the booth and I was like, wow. So there were some hungry plant shoppers. Um, those are your four orchid types that you're gonna find for sale pri prim primarily in any of the big box stores and the bag babies like this. We are carrying the bag babies. Um, they are very popular. They're done by um, Better Grow Orchids over in Arcadia. You will find in these bag babies um, some really neat stuff. You will find some stuff in these bags, some really neat different orchids, not that you're gonna typically find in the grocery store or Home Depot or Lowe's. So a plant like this, Normally, in a four-inch pot this size, is going to be $25 at a show. We're selling them for $19. I don't remember what, you know, the big box stores are selling them. Shop them. Look for the stuff in these bags at the big box stores and look for them here. Um, the one I've got in my hand is Brassavola nodosa. It is a Catalea species. I don't want to hear any more radio. I don't have to deal with it today. Um, look for these guys. Um, Brassavola nodosa actually grows in mangrove swamps. Um, when it blooms, it has a white flower. You can see the picture of the flower on the packaging. If you're, if you're looking at these and you want to know what they are, look for the white tag and then go to Google and put that name in there exactly on the tag. A picture of that orchid will come up on Google now. So orchids are pretty popular. Um, you know, this one, Lady of the Night, it got that name. Does anybody know why? Sherry, shut up. Well, it blooms all day and all night. So there's a reason it's called Lady of the Night. Doesn't smell. No, it's a white flower. All right. You touched on something I want to talk about too. So, smell. All right. Certain orchids have a fragrance. They don't smell. <laughs> now, there are some that do smell like rotting meat. <laughs> and there was somebody actually at Garden Fest that had some for sale this year. Normally, you don't find them that often at Garden Fest at Garden Fest, excuse me. But um, they're bulbophyllums. When they flower, the flower smells like rotting meat. Now, each orchid will put off a different fragrance or will, will put out a different fragrance or at a different time. Anybody know why? You know? Why? Okay, they're gonna put out a fragrance at a time or a smell that's going to attract the pollinator for that flower. Okay, the one that stinks like rotting meat, what do you think its pollinator is? Flies. This one blooms at night, all right? The minute it gets dark, the fragrance turns on. The minute you turn a light on, the fragrance turns off. It's like flipping a light switch on it. Um, Lady of the Night, it's the perfume comes on when it's pitch black out. What flies around at night in pitch black? Not mosquitoes. Mosquitoes don't pollinate anything. Bats, close, but not the right animal. All right, you turn your porch light on, what starts fly? Yep, moths. Moths will pollinate this. Um, 
Everybody knows about the orchid that Darwin talked about, the big star-shaped orchid with the long spur on the back. It's pollinated by a moth. In order for that moth to pollinate it, it's got to have a proboscis that goes all the way into the back of that flower spike. And that flower spike comes back down about that long. Wow. So a moth has a tongue on it that long. <laughs> it's the giraffe, giraffe in the insect world, right? Um, this one, another neat orchid. It's in the dendrobium family. Like I said, you can get some neat stuff in these bags. Um, this thing, when it blooms, has a powerful fragrance. It is so strong, it actually does stink. It's a perfume. It smells nice, but there's so much of it, it causes a headache. Wow. It will stink you out of a van in a closed up van. What's the name? It's Dendrobium spectable. And if you get a chance, look at the picture of the flowers. The flowers are all wrinkled and striped and really kind of neat looking. It's a neat orchid. Yes. No. If you've got a squirrel problem, get a BB gun. <laughs> because they will eat your orchid flowers. Oh. Or get a slingshot and just wing them. Yes. Somebody had a question? How do indoor orchids pollinate? They don't. Indoor orchids are not going to get pollinated. You have to do it for them. And there is a gentleman in the Vero Beach Orchid Society that does give a talk about orchid sex. I'm not going there. So we'll, we'll, we'll stay away from that. To pollinate and create um, orchid babies and seed pods is quite a lengthy process. It's not easy. You have to have a lab and sterile conditions. Okay. But we're not, we're not going to go there. It's just too much work. Yes, ma'am. Maybe, if you're nice. <laughs> um, we did do some mounting. I did do a mounting class back in July. The orchids back on the trees are the results of that mounting class. Those, anybody come for that class in July? OK. The big shumburki on the piece of bamboo is hanging up in the front shade house. Take a look at it. It's grown in nicely. Um, it's starting to get there. I expect to see that thing starting to put some flower spikes out, hopefully within the next month. Um, what I want to talk about now is now that we've kind of covered orchids a little bit and the different types, I want to talk to you about watering them. Um, well, Okay, I'm going to stand in front of the vandas for a reason. All right, vandas, non-orchids, phalaenopsis, do not have what's called a pseudobulb. All right, and I'll pick up a plant that does have a pseudobulb and explain it for you. This one's not for sale. I'm buying it. Y'all are out of luck. Pseudobulbs are the part of the orchid that starts at the bottom, that comes up. It's the fleshy, hard part, all right? Pseudo meaning false, bulb meaning like bulb like an onion, all right? The way to equate that is they act like a battery. They hold food and water and nutrients for the plant, all right? Phalaenopsis, the nun orchid, the spathoglottis down here with the little purple flowers, they don't have pseudobulbs. They require a little more water. So you have to water them a little more frequently. You don't want to let them dry out real hard. The plant will suffer. Um, anything with a pseudobulb, cattleyas, oncidiums, um, there's a whole host of like bulbophyllums, dendrobiums, all kinds of stuff that have pseudobulbs. Anything with a pseudobulb with that battery can take drying out completely without hurting it. 
How many of you have lady slippers? Lady slipper orchids. All right, lady slippers are a whole nother critter. They're technically not an orchid, but the way you water them, you water them frequently enough, the roots, the white roots on the lady slippers have little fine hairs on them. You do not let those little fine hairs dry out. It will suffer, it will kill the plant. So slippers are a whole nother ball game altogether. They're classified with orchids, but technically they are not an orchid. Now this thing, all right, you're not supposed to grow down into the pot. Um, this is a dendrobium. You remember I called the other dendrobium a hard cane dendrobium. This is what's considered a soft cane dendrobium. Soft canes are all typically identifiable by one thing that happens to them from October through usually April. All the leaves fall off of them typically. Now this poor thing's been in the front shade house has not gotten cold, has not stopped being watered or fertilized, so it's kept all its leaves on it. This orchid, that 31 degrees that we had the other night, could sit outside all day and just thrive in it. And actually it will bloom harder in that. Now you'll see, when I grow orchids, I like to grow them in bark. I'm a heavy waterer. They grow this in moss. All right, this when it grows, when it's in active growth, grows really fast, it puts on new growth very quickly. So it needs all the nutrients it can get. From October through, I would say on this one, probably about another month and a half, no fertilizer. It can get watered, but no fertilizer. You've gotta stress this out to make it drop the leaves so that it will send out its bloom spikes. Now, this one is starting to bud out. All right, this is what's called a dendrobium noble. And at the axis of each leaf, it will develop a flower spike. And you'll get three, two, three flowers on each spike. And that whole column should be full of flowers. Um, this one has not been grown ideally, but it's still a good little plant. Like I said, you can't have it, it's going home with me. Um, there's a reason for that. The grower that propagates these in Japan used to have an outlet in Hawaii. They've closed that outlet. They're no longer available. These are going to start getting scarce and they're going to start getting harder and harder to find. Um, Dendrobium nobles, if you water them from October through, I would say April, um, all you'll get is green growth. You, if it buds out and you fertilize and water it, instead of getting flower buds at the axis, you'll get little new little plants, okay? Used to be very hard to grow these. Nobody could figure it out. I've got a friend down in Fort Lauderdale that I know that used to work at an orchid grower that takes them out. If they're potted in bark, he takes them out of bark, puts them in moss, puts them back in a plastic pot, and grows them and waters them every day, grows them in full sun. Now, if I were to take this and put it in a basket or put it in a bigger pot and put it in full sun, I'm gonna sunburn every leaf on this. I'm not, I don't care. Do you know why? The leaves are supposed to fall off. They're going to fall off. So if the, if the leaves on this sunburn, I'm not worried about that. I want it to get as much energy to produce as many flowers on this as possible. He took a plant like this and in two years, took it in for judging. It had over 600 flowers on it. Normally, I used to try to grow these, I'd kill them, or I'd get maybe 10, 12 flowers maximum. He started telling me how to grow them. I've got one that I bought in a little two inch pot at the greenhouse this morning. It's probably got 20 flowers on it. So it's doing well, it's doing what it's supposed to. I grow these with vandas. I'll put them in a plastic pot, hang them up, and grow them with vandas where they get watered every day, and they get lots of food during the growing season. Now, October, I move them out of the Vanda area, put them out where they get brighter light with no fertilizer, and then let them go. Unfortunately, like I said, these are gonna get hard to find. So, if you see them, get them. I asked Better Grow if they're gonna have any more available this year. They said no, 
their Den crop crapped out. Dendrobium noble. Noble. What yep. About Nestor? I, I got a dendrobium that's Nestor. that's Nestor is in the soft cane dendrobium type. It should be dropping all its leaves as well. All right. There's a class of dendrobiums in the soft canes that it's called anosum. There are some subspecies called Nestor and stuff. The canes will actually come down and grow down and hang down. Um, and when the plant gets bit, it looks like a head full of dreadlocks hanging down. When the flowers bloom, they smell like raspberries. What ones do you not fertilize? The soft cane dendrobiums. Yeah, what months? From October through April. Thank yep. If, they, if the bulbs start to shrivel up a little bit, you can give them a, a quick drink with some water, um, but don't fertilize them, okay? Now, remember I told you um, pseudobulbs, all right? Even the Tarit Vanda basically has a pseudobulb on it. It's one long pseudobulb, but it's still a pseudobulb. It can store some food and water. Now that plant does like water every day. It grows like a weed out in full sun. I water it every day because it is out in full sun and I'm pushing it to grow, all right? Um, I wanna talk about fertilizer and stuff real quick. Um, how many of you fertilize your orchids once a month? Raise your hands. Okay, how many of you fertilize every other week? All right, let's go at this. How many of you fertilize your orchids once every six months? Shame on you. All right, you can have a McDonald's hamburger for the rest of the month. That's it, nothing else. That's what you're doing to your orchids, all right? The nutritional value in the pots is zero. They get no nutrition out of the pots. You have to feed them with a water-soluble fertilizer. Now, I don't, well, I do care which brand you use. Everybody's familiar with Better Grow, all right? The gentleman that started this company and started the fertilizer formulas is over in Sarasota. His name is um, Rob Palmer. He works for Better Grow. He's retiring now. Um, he developed those fertilizer formulas, probably some of the best in the industry, except for one thing Better Grow didn't count on. Rob developed his own fertilizer. And he sells it at his greenhouse over in Sarasota. Lucky for you, I've got it here. Um, this is, how many of you ever heard of the Michigan State Fertilizer for Orchids? It's the best fertilizer in the country, right? Yeah. This mimics the Michigan State Fertilizer for Orchids. It is probably the best fertilizer you can put on your orchids. It beats what he did with that. He tried to mimic it, but couldn't quite copy it for legal reasons. So he didn't. Now he's gone off on his own. He's not worried about it. He changed a few things. He's added a couple of things to this um, that the Michigan State Fertilizer Company does not, or the Michigan State Formula does not have. So he's changed it a little bit and I think he's improved on it. Um, this is called Palmer's Orchid Special. Um, it is a calcium magnesium fertilizer. It will produce bigger, stronger growth. It will give you bigger flowers and double the flowers. It is that good. Most of your full-time hobbyists, give me a second, Sherry. Yeah. Most of your full-time hobbyists that are, have large orchid collections are using his fer fertilizer now. Um, I brought it over on this side of the state Actually, I didn't bring it over on this side of the state. It's actually made here in Vero Beach. Oh, wow. It's actually made up off of 41st or 45th at the old Miracle Grow fertilizer plant. Oh, okay. So is the Better Grow fertilizer. Oh. It's made here in Vero Beach and then shipped over to the state and then sold around the world. Now, so, is water soluble, you said? Yeah, so both of them are water soluble. All right, Better Grow does have a product that is a slow release. All right. How many of you fertilize every week? All right, if you're fertilizing every week, okay, I'm gonna give you the example, you with the cheeseburger from McDonald's, all right. 
if I were to give you a cheeseburger once a week, how healthy are you going to be? Not two. Not two. That's the same thing you're doing to your orchids when you're giving them fertilizer once a month. All right, they're, they're going to do okay. They're not going to grow real strong. They're still going to, they're going to go along, but they're going to struggle. All right, if you feed it evenly, more frequently, it's going to grow better, more evenly. You're going to get bigger flowers and more flowers. Feed them. They need it. Now, if you're a lazy orchid grower, how many of you water them once a month? Raise your hands, you lazy people. Use a slow release also. This is not gonna take care of the orchid all the time, but if you don't have the time constraints and you're just so busy that you can only think about it, put some slow release on the top of the pot. Whenever you water it, it's gonna get a little bit of food at least. Now, when I repot all of my collection, I will put a tablespoon on the top of each pot I repot, just to help them as they're growing. Even though I fertilize, when I fertilize with my watering system, there's a little bit of fertilizer that comes through the watering lines every time I water. Yes. Yes. Except for certain ones that need to be stressed out to bloom. The Dendrobium nobles, any of the soft cane orchids, don't like, you know, they need a winter rest. Yes, sir. Okay. You only have one orchid? Okay. Um, don't do that. All right. If you put that, here's what he's doing is he's mixing up a bucket with fertilizer. And this is important because it's, it's really important with orchids, especially. Um, if you're mixing up a bucket of orchid food and you put that first plant in that bucket and say it has fungus or rot in that pot, you just gave it to every other orchid you just put in that bucket. Water is the number one transmission for fungus and rot. So you're going to do better. And actually, um, when you put it in the bucket like that, you should only have to leave it in there for maybe five minutes. Any longer than that, it's not, it can only absorb so much water at once or food at once. It's going to take it up in the first five minutes. And then it's done. So it's not like, you know, a swimming pool where you turn the faucet on and it's just going to keep filling up. Orchids don't do that. They only take in so many nutrients and then they stop. Okay. Now, who waters their orchids in the afternoon, late afternoon? Anybody? Nobody. Good. Y'all are learning something. Oh, Rebecca, are you watering your stuff in the afternoon? See, you have friends. Make her come over and water your orchids for you. <laughs> Sherry, help a, help a pal out. I can tell you since I've been watering weekly, our flowers are bigger. Yep. Our Atlantis, and I have big clusters of Dumbertias that are just going crazy. Much better. Much, much better. The term, the term for fertilizing your orchids every week Normally, most people will take the directions on the package. They will cut that amount of fertilizer in half, and they will fertilize every week. We call that weekly, weekly in the industry. It's Would that be the same thing with the Palmers? Even the Palmers, yeah. Palmers is special fertilizer. It is, I mean, it is good stuff. It's all I'm using now. I don't use anything else. So... So now with the Palmers, I'm going to recommend to you guys, um, if you do get into Palmers fertilizer, you decide to go that route. That's going to be every 20 minutes from now on. We'll give them a second to go by so you guys can hear me. It's going to be a long one. It's a freight train. I'm going to try and shout off. Let me know if you can't hear me. So I'm going to try and talk above the train. Palmer's fertilizer, when you open that bag, is hydroscopic. That means the minute you open it up to the air, it starts soaking up moisture just like a box or a, a thing of damp red. It will soak up moisture. So when you open that bag, 
transfer it to Tupperware where you can keep it sealed. That way it'll stay dry. Um, it is probably the best orchid fertilizer that you can use on your plants now. Um, I don't think there's a better formula out there anywhere. Literally, don't think, not at all. Um, every, can you use it every week? Yes. I, the way I water my, or my orchids, um, I have what's called a fertilizer injector. I mix everything up in a bucket, like a 30 gallon trash can. I put my fertilizer in there, fill the bucket up with water, and there's a hose that comes in and drops down into the bucket that comes up into a device called a fertilizer injector that pumps water into my watering lines. It, it pumps that concentrate into the watering lines so that when I turn the water on, there's a little bit of food going out through my, my water system. That's how I, I'm doing mine. I have 600 orchids. Do you know how long it would take me to water every morning? If I did it by hand, yeah. I, my stuff, I water twice a week, but I feed heavily once a week. And you water in the morning? Yep. Um, when you water your orchids, water them in the morning. Um, water them before 11 o'clock if you can help it. You can go up to two. Um, anything past that, don't. Um, because when when orchids go to sleep at night, you want them to be completely dry. Fungus and rot shows up in water when it's dark and it's cold and they don't dry out. That's when your fungus and rot problems are gonna show up. Now, has anybody had any problems with rot or fungus after these cold snaps when it's been cold and wet? This is the time to watch for it. You're gonna see it. It'll pop up real quick. Um, usually it's black or the tissue turns brown and mushy. So, it, you know, if you ever have a problem, you can bring it in, bring pictures, or bring the plan in. We'll take a look at it. Yes, back in the back. That's black rot. That's a type of rot. So with black rot, black rot's a little bit different. You have to take the plant out of the pot, take it apart, cut out the black rot, and um, try and save the plant. Black rot, if you get it in your plants, will kill your plant within a week and a half. It will go very quickly. Okay, you had a question. Do you spray the orchids or do you normally spray it watering? Mine is done with a sprinkler system that waters everything. Yeah, if you have a smaller collection, I suggest you use your garden hose and use Use a wand with a water breaker on the end so that it softens the water spray on your plants. It's much more gentle. You're gonna get a more even flow of water out of this than taking your hose, putting your thumb on the end of it and pressure washing your orchid. Don't do that. I've got one girl here that I keep catching with her thumb on the end of the hose on my vandas back there. The next time I catch her, I'm gonna crown her. So. You can mist, but you need to, when, when you water orchids, water them heavily. Just let them dry out in between watering, okay? Now, if you're watering, use a, use a, a wand or a water breaker. You can buy these separately and they attach right to the end of your hose. These things are godsend and they won't tear up your plants. If you've got annuals, annual flowers, baskets, hanging pots, you know, use this on those too. That's all I use. Um, I use this in the nursery here when I'm watering. I don't use my thumb over the end of the hose like a lot of the guys here do on the bigger plants. I even use this on the big palm trees. Yes. Probably the best water you can put on your orchids is rain water. You'll see your orchids respond better um, better nutrients, better chemicals, or better, let's just say better nutrients in the rainwater. It's, it's just better for them. It also has a lot of nitrogen in it. So if you can water with rainwater, water with rainwater.
Just don't dunk them. <laughs> Promise me you won't dunk. Do you sell those heads yes, we do sell them. I do have heads up there. Uh, so, you know, we also have the wands. I'm not here to push products on you guys. I'm here to teach you on how to get it done and get it done effectively without, you know, with the least amount of trouble, okay? <laughs> I got into an argument with a master grower about a, two weeks ago here. All right, what temperature does ice melt at? 32 degrees. It starts melting at 32 degrees. All right, these are tropical plants. You're putting ice water on a tropical plant. That plant's going to get really pissed off. Um, the Just Add Ice was a gimmick, a marketing gimmick from a company out of Illinois. It has caught on. Some people do it. They don't have any problems. I know better. My tropical plants don't like freezing water. Okay? If you're going to water your plants, you've got a few, say, phalaenopsis, take them to the kitchen sink, put them in the kitchen sink, fill the pot up, especially if they're in moss, fill the pot up, let it soak up for about five minutes, then come back, fill the pot up again. What you're doing is you're letting all the moss in the pot, the first time you water it, all the moss on the outside edges is gonna soak up that water first. When you hit it the second time, all the stuff on the outside is already full. It's gonna to get to the center, so you're gonna water that orchid f evenly. If you just put you know, two or three ice cubes on there, what's gonna happen is it's just gonna drip, drip down a little bit. It's not enough to keep them happy. The key is to let them dry out a little bit in between watering. Yes, ma'am. So my sprayer has different settings. Okay. Can you use the mist setting or the shower setting? What? Use the shower setting. Yeah, that's what I yeah, use a shower, if you've got a mist or a spray wand or head, use a shower setting, don't turn it up on high, you know, cut the flow rate back, the pressure back to half, okay? Just remember, water them thoroughly, but water them well, but let them dry out in between watering. Okay. Somebody had a question over here? No? Okay. Yes? This is a simple question, Matt, because I'm a newbie. So you put it in the sink and you water it once, you wait like five minutes and you do it again. When do you do the fertilizer? Maybe once a week. But you water them once a week. Isn't that the same time the fertilizer? You can do, if it's a, if it's a phalaenopsis with moss in it, when you're watering it, prime it the first time with water. The second time, go back and give it the um, water, the orchid fertilizer, okay? What that'll do is it'll prime the outside and it'll get to the center of the plant a lot better, okay? Yes, ma'am? Magnesium, magnesium. If you're using Palmer's, CalMag, it's magnesium, calcium and magnesium, should pull it back out of that. Cataleas and some Vandas like Evelyn down here, she's mad at me because she's been in, inside for the last two weeks. And then um, she did get some cold before that real hard cold snap got, it, got us. But for the real hard cold snap, she was inside. But you can see some of the red fleck freckling on there that's from cold that's that's a magnesium deficiency don't don't water your orchids before freeze what you're doing is you're loading that plant up with water that water in the plants gonna freeze um, and when it does water freezes it expands so it's gonna cause tissue damage. Um, back in 2010, when we had those, what, two weeks of freezing weather, um, you saw that with a lot of the palm trees. Um, everybody watered them before, the heads got wet, you know, water got down in the heads, the water froze, it killed the heads, they expanded, then the rot and fungus came in, okay? Um, don't water before freeze, unless you put them inside where they're warm. Um, if you're going to put them inside, yeah, go ahead and water them. If they're going to stay outside, don't water them before it gets cold. Yes, ma'am. Like 
If they're in the ground, um, you can water them okay. You shouldn't have a problem. Orchids, I'm primarily talking about orchids. Your house plants, you should be able to water without any problem before it gets cold, okay? Because most of that water is gonna go down into the soil anyways. Those plants are gonna take up what they need. If it's in a pot, I would be very careful about watering it before freeze. Okay. Yes. Her question is, when do you change the orchid or, and repot it? That's changing a little bit because of several reasons. When I got into the industry, um, the cue was repot your orchids every two years. Get them out of the old potting material, clean the pots, um, repot them with new bark, all right? There's a new orchid bark out on the market called Orchiata, and I, I'm carrying it here because I use it myself and I know it works. I've got plants at home that have now been in pots with Orchiata for seven years, and that bark still looks as good as the first day I put it in that pot. Okay, Orchiata. It's a little bag down here on the ground. All right. Orchiata, for every, everybody knows the better grow orchid bark that's, you know, in the orchid room. Everybody's familiar with that, yes? Yes, yes. Okay. That orchid bark, you need to repot every two years. It's going to break down and decompose within two years. And this heat and humidity, it turns to mud after two years. Okay, Orchiata will not. So in five to seven years, you're gonna repot that plant two, three times, all right? If you use one bag of, of the Better Grow every two to three years, you're gonna use one bag of Orchiata. Orchiata. So um, it's probably one of the best orchid barks I've ever seen. Um, there was a gentleman out of Sarasota, Paul Storm, that grows Schumberkias. He brought it to the Orchid Society. Just about every member of the Orchid Society is now using it. They love it. I love it. Um, water goes right through it. It doesn't hold a lot of moisture. The roots have a chance to dry out. What's the number one killer of orchids besides you guys? <laughs> Root rot. Too much water. The number one killer for your orchid Give me your fail. <laughs> All right, you can see this plant is drooping. All right, all the leaves are drooping down. The leaves shouldn't droop. They should be standing up like this. All right, they should be stiff and hard. Um, this one, unfortunately, is just draping down and over. What's going on here is he has not watered enough. It's potted in bark. All right, if you're going to... Oh, oh, he's pointing to her. He's throwing her under the bus. Guess who's not getting dinner tonight? Um, when, you, when you grow them in bark, and he's growing in bark, um, you have to water more frequently. Why? Has no pseudobulb. Has no way to store food and water. So you need to water it a little more frequently. Now, this can be rectified. This can be fixed. It's just water it a little more frequently. Now, if this were in moss and he brought it to me looking like this, I'm going to tell him to take it out of the pot, look at the roots, because most of the roots have probably rotted off. Usually, the number one killer of orchids is watering them too much. You know, it's not a house plant. It's not a pansy where you have to water it every day in soil, okay, where the soil just dries out. These guys are built differently than your regular house plants. If you have a problem keeping house plants alive, you should do wonderful with this. Oh my God, you should do phenomenal with orchids. I mean, if you're not watering your house plants every day like you're supposed to, start growing orchids. It's a little bit easier. I remember the first time I ever saw orchids was a couple up in um, a popka that bred parrots. Um, and they had a whole bunch of cataleas and probably some of the prettiest stuff I've ever seen. I was scared to death. I thought orchids were touchy and that if you looked at them wrong, they'd die. Mine don't die. They jump off the bench and commit suicide, but... Um, actually, you know, don't do that. 
you may have root problems. Okay. Um, when you do water them, she's got rocks in the bottom so it doesn't sit down in the water. Um, if you're growing, in, growing them in pots that don't have drain holes in the bottom, be very careful that you're not setting them back in water. Any standing water is an ideal situation for rot and fungus, okay? Um, take them out, make sure they're drained. If you're going to water them, put them in the kitchen sink, fill them up, water them real well, let them drip dry, and then put them back in your decorative containers. Yes, ma'am. So after the cold spell, my leaves started turning, uh, drying out. Real okay. Bad. Did they change color at all? Turn a little reddish orange? Well, I don't know, but the, the leaf is like all brown now. I mean, you know, it's dry. Oh, it, it sounds like the cold got it. Okay. It okay. sounds like frost got it. So what do I do with the plants? Um, you can bring it in, show it to me, and I'll tell you if it's going to live or not. Oh, okay. So. Um, Phalaenopsis, this, this does not like below 50 degrees like Vanda's. Um, they need to be protected. Um, if yeah, you're, I covered them, but if, they well, now here's the stupid thing. See the Phalaenopsis back on the tree? Mm -hmm. I did nothing. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm wide open. So, I mean, it's under, it's under a canopy, so it didn't have frost settle on it. I mean, if you're wide open and you've got these out in the landscape at 31 degrees, you're going to get frost on them and it's going to affect the plants. Now, a lot of, a lot of my catalayas and stuff that had flowers on them during that frost, all the flowers dried out and fell off. So, it'll come back. Yeah, and I had one try to bloom, but, or tried to bud, but, but the cold got to it, so it died. Okay. Now... One of you asked, you asked me, when is it time to repot an orchid? I brought a really good example. All right. When is it time to repot an orchid? <laughs> like I said, I've got some plants that have been in pots for seven years. I've got 600 orchids. I don't spend the time on mine as often as I should. Now, there's a reason with this one um, this is a different orchid. This is a special orchid. Um, how many of you are familiar with the TV show Ironside? Mm -hmm. Who was the actor? This was one of Raymond Burr's orchids. Oh my um, Raymond Burr had an orchid nursery out in California called Sea Goddess Nursery. This is one of his. Um, it is actually a Schomburgia and Catalea cross hybrid. Now, I took it out of the pot. I had a friend whose husband developed um, colon cancer. We did two orchid auctions for him. I took divisions off of this plant and a bunch of my other stuff and donated them for a um, auction to raise money for him. Um, this plant, um, you know, the two divisions that I took raised some really good money for him. This is a plant with Providence. Um, it's not something that you're going to see every day. You really got to hunt for something like this. Um, I will tell you the flower is ugly, but it has providence. And what, what's the name of it? Um, it's Johnny Era Raymond Babe. And it's actually from Sea God Nursery. It has everything on the tag. All right. Now, remember when I told you, when is it time to repot? Um, you can see, obviously, the roots are shot. You know, the old bulbs have died back. Um, the move was not very kind to it. I took it out of the pot to divide it up for the couple of pieces. I think I gave a couple of pieces to some friends that helped with the auction as a gift. Um, okay, sorry about that. I'll come back to the center. Um, I took this out of the pot when it was time to do the orchid auction. I didn't repot it and pot it back up, and it's been just sitting in that pot for probably two years now. I haven't messed with it. I've left it alone. Um, but it's one of those things I want to make sure that I, I get straightened out now that I'm at the new place. When it's time to repot, obviously the plant's going to grow out of the pot. This one's done that. It's grown out of the pot. You can see everything came up out of the pot, and it's trying to grow. Now, when you start seeing the old bulbs, we're going to do a repotting thing real quick, just so I can show you guys. When it's time to repot, you want to take the old dead parts off. And let me see, right there. 
you want to look for the last pseudobulb that's still green, okay? And that's going to be right here. Let's see if I can cut this out of the way so you guys can see. You're going to see where the new growth comes up out of this bulb right here. Yep. Everything from there up is green and good. That's where you cut it. That's what you repot, okay? Now, how many of you have heard me talk about repotting? How do I trim it up? How do I clean up the roots? I cut all the roots off. All right, when I, when I go to put this back in the pot, I'm not gonna be able to get all that back in the pot anyways. Most of those are gonna die off, yes? No, you can water them and peel them off. Um, if they're on a pot, I've, I've dealt with some cattleyas that are really overgrown and just roots all over the pot. You can't even see the pot anymore. Just cut them with a straight edge razor blade all the way around, peel them up, and then pull them up out of the pot. All right, yes ma'am. Yes, these clippers are sterilized. They've not been used on anything else. I did them at home, thank you, smart Alec. <laughs> I always get called out by my orchid people, all right? There is a torch here. There is another pair of clippers here somewhere. Where to put them? There was another pair. They're here, oh, here they are. There's another pair of clippers. These are normally what I'm using when I'm repotting. These get heated with an open flame off the plumber's torch. I flame them every time I go to divide an orchid. If I go from this orchid to another one, the, the clippers get torched and heated up. What you're doing is you're sterilizing it, you're stopping any bacteria or any virus from going from plant to plant, okay? Now, that being said, when it's time to repot it, when you repot any of the cats, you want to make sure that you've got at least four of the pseudobulbs, one, two, three, four, five, and the sixth one's starting to grow, all right? When you put it back in a pot, if I were to put this thing smack dab in the center, what's going on with it right now? It's already growing out of the pot. So when you put it in the pot, bring it back to the back edge, and let that front center lead grow out in the middle of the pot. That way it has time to go in this pot. Now, I'm not gonna put it back in this pot. This is only a five inch clay pot. It's gonna go up to either a six inch plastic like this. Now it's got more room. When you repot, you wanna step up to the next size up pot, but you don't wanna go from this To this. You want to go from this to the next size up pot, which is a six inch pot instead of an eight inch. If you put it in this, that orchid is going to struggle and probably die because it just can't seed itself in that pot. So what I'm going to do is put it back in plastic and then repot it. I soak mine in bleach water for 24 hours to 48 hours, take them out, scrub them, let them air dry. Once they are air dried, mine go in the oven at 400 degrees for two hours. I don't play. Um, virus is a number one problem with orchids, especially in old orchid collections. Um, it can get on some of the um, orchids. Who knows what I'm doing with the cinnamon? Raise your hand if you know. Okay, for those of you that don't know, cinnamon is a bark. It also has antifungal properties and antibacterial properties. It stops that raw cut from getting infected. So I've just sealed that cut. 
and you can just use regular cinnamon from the grocery store. Now, when it's time to put it back in the pot, remember you've got a pseudobulb here. When you pot this, you want this pseudobulb to be at the top of the bark when you put it in the pot, okay? So you put it up at the back of the pot, take your bark mix, Fill in around it and it's repotted. It's done. It should be in this pot for at least four to five years easily if it's in Orchiata. 